everybody, welcome. Welcome to Village Church. Excited to have you here. We're going to start the service a little early. We're doing a prelude song for you guys. This is a song you may or may not know. Um, it's called Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Does anybody know that song already? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, hi, Don over there knows it. Uh, so it's a new song. This is going to be the theme song for the second John series, which starts next week. Um, so we wanted to teach it to you today so that next week you guys are ready to hit the ground running. Sing this one. We're going to sing great truths about who Jesus is together. I'm going to have you guys stay seated since you don't know it yet. Once you, once you learn it, though, feel free to join in and sing with us. All right? All right, let's do it. Welcome. Good morning. All right. Active crowd today. <laughs> Sorry. Let's try it one more time because that's what I have to do. This is part of the liturgy. Good morning. All right. Amen. Isn't this good news? As we consider the cross, as we consider the price of our redemption, it came at great cost. It came at the, the death 
of God's one and only son, Jesus, and his resurrection. It's amazing truth. We are no longer slaves to sin because of the work he did on the cross. So we're going to respond to that good news, and we're actually going to lift up uh, the call to worship from Psalm 96, which is going to give us a lot of action verbs. And who here is a singer? Anybody? All right. Uh, let me just tell you this. If you are a redeemed child of God, you are a singer today. All right? That's our calling, is to come and to faithfully sing his praises. And he's going to call us to do just that in Psalm 96. So in reverence to God's word, let's stand. I'm going to have you guys read the text in yellow. Hear this word from the Lord. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth.
present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. to our own strength, we couldn't do it. And continually, we need to come to the Lord and, and confess that we alone fall short. I'm going to pray a prayer of confession. Eternal and merciful God, you have loved us with a love beyond our understanding. And you have set us on paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And yet... We have strayed from your way. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, through what we have done and what we have left undone. As we remember the lavish gift of your grace symbolized in baptism, oh God, we praise you and give you thanks that you forgive us yet again. Grant us now, we pray, the grace to die daily to sin, and to rise daily to the new life in Christ who lives and reigns with you and in whose strong name we pray. Amen. And with that confession, let us also remember the assurance that we get from God's word. Listen to this from Ezekiel. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Oh, lift your eyes to heaven, see the whole. sound 
be seated. get better than this. We've got some baptisms in the house this morning. All right, now here's the deal. Yes, we got to have an agreement that baptisms are a powerful celebration. So we got to be loud as these baptisms happen. This is, uh, this is a celebration of what God is doing in the lives of these two students. We have up here Josh and Rebecca Iso. They're going to come in just a moment and be baptized. But I just want to share a couple words before we do this, just to be clear. In this, this pool, some of you are like, wait, where is he? This is actually, we got a baptismal tank right here. Um, and in this, this baptismal tank, this, is, this water here is not somehow special. This is not supernatural, holy water. This is probably water that came from Lake Michigan. I mean, it's, it's normal water. What's powerful with this is what Josh and Rebecca are going to do, that they are going to come here and they're going testi to testify to their faith. They're going to explain they're going to share about how they've put their trust in Jesus Christ and as we're as we as I baptize them we're going to really show what has already happened this is a symbol a celebration of what's happened in their life that as as they are placed under the water that they are identifying and remembering the death of Jesus Christ they're saying Jesus you did die and and and, and I don't want that just to be a distant thing I, I believe that with all of me and identify with your death in, in, in essence, their, their sinful past is going to be dead and left in the water too. But I will guarantee you this, we're going to lift them up. I'm going to lift them up. We're not going to keep them under the water. And as they come up, we're going to celebrate the new life that they have in Jesus Christ. And this is a powerful image. You can, you can read about that in the beginning verses of Romans 6. So we're going to begin with Joshua. Joshua, come on down and you're going to have a chance to share your testimony. Hi. Um, for me, I've grown up in a Christian home, so I'm thankful for that. I haven't really struggled with any questions like, is, does God exist? I always took it as like a fact, and I just want to dedicate my life today. Um, my family usually waits for like us to be adults, but like when corona came like we didn't know when we would get another chance to get a baptism so we decided to do it now amen josh is one of the, the high school students in our student ministries and i can tell you that um, for this young man i've seen a clear uh, profession of his faith and beyond that just an incredible depth this this young man is pursuing god every once in a while we'll launch Bible reading plans on the YouVersion U app, and Josh will put a comment on there that will just be like a mic drop. It'll be like, whoa, this young man is really, really, really thinking deeply about the Lord. He loves the Lord, and the other students will be like, you kind of catch that Josh maybe is a little bit quiet, but they'll be like, wow, there is so much in Josh, and so I just want to affirm uh, his profession of faith and how he is he is truly walking with Jesus Christ. So Josh, based on your profession of faith and how you are living out the Christian life, I have the honor and privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right. All right, now we're going to have Rebecca come on down. All right, All right Rebecca is going to have a chance to share her profession of faith. <laughs> um, there was a time where I was having a lot of self-doubts, and I actually hit a lot of self-hatred, and um, it weighed me down a lot, uh, but long story short, my parents found out, and it was when we prayed that it felt like the weight on my shoulders burned up and turned into ashes, 
by the Holy Spirit fire that burned brightly inside me. That moment for me was a confirmation. I want to follow Jesus. Amen. And Rebecca, Rebecca is in our, our middle school group. And this, this girl, um, she's been so faithful of, through, through the pandemic, popping on to, to Zoom. I mean, doing youth group on Zoom is not the easiest thing in the world. I have uh, huge props for young people that have been doing that, whether it's in school or youth group. And she would come on and just see, seeing the life in you, Rebecca, and the joy in you, and seeing that match with her pursuit of Jesus. And I think you catch that, that her... Her testimony is attached with some, some, some questions, some, some hard times, in that as we come to Jesus, we don't have to have it all together. You don't have to have it all together. You come how you are, and Jesus receives you that way. And I see the Lord in you, Rebecca, really doing that transforming work. So I'm excited for that. So just as I did to your, to your brother, I'm, I have the privilege of baptizing you now. Based on your the profession of your faith and how you are living and walking out the Christian life, I, ba I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah! Woo! That is so awesome. Thank you for cheering them on, too. We want to celebrate with them. And maybe after service you see them, just give them uh, a huge congratulations. And um, I know that their parents are excited, and, and a grandparent here, too, honored and excited to see them take this step. I wanted to, but Brandon's going to be sharing a little bit about announcement for this summer. But tied into that is that on the third outdoor service, this is going to be on Sunday, October 1st, we are going to August be, that's going to be an actual outdoor baptism service. All right? So for that, we need a whole bunch of you that's, that take that step to say, like, I am going to be baptized. I want to be baptized. I have put my trust in Christ, and I want to take that step. Maybe you are a young person, and you sense like, yeah, this is the time. But you know, maybe you're, you're an adult. Maybe you're a parent. Maybe you're a grandparent, and you've never taken that step of baptism. This is a step of identifying Jesus was baptized, and Jesus in the Great Commission called us to, baptize, to be baptized and baptize other people. So we want you to be prayerfully considering that. You can reach out to the church. We're going to have more information in weeks to come about how to sign up and be a part of that outdoor baptism. So Brandon, on to you. And you know, as uh, we're observing a baptism, I was just think about doing this on Memorial Day weekend. And you know, certainly here during a Memorial Day weekend, we take time to, uh, to remember those who have uh, paid the ultimate price uh, for those of us uh, here in the United States to enjoy uh, the freedoms that, that we have, and we'll be doing some more things to acknowledge that uh, later in the service. But uh, I was reminded of how God has set up these ordinances as ways to help us remember uh, the death of Jesus. Uh, we'll be uh, actually uh, remembering Jesus' death uh, next week in our worship services as we take part in the Lord's Supper. Um, but as we participate in baptism, uh, it reminds us of just as how Jesus died and then was raised to life, uh, that, that through faith in Christ, that even though we are dead to sin, that we are now alive to God in Christ. And that's the unique thing about baptism, that it reminds us not only of the death of Jesus, but the resurrection of Jesus. And because Jesus lives, uh, we too will live as we place our faith in him, as we receive the undeserved gift of eternal life. And I uh, hope and pray that uh, if you haven't had taken that step of baptism yet to proclaim on the outside what Jesus has already done for you on the inside, as Pastor Dan said, I hope that you will take that step with us here uh, coming up on August 1st. Uh, we want to welcome all of you uh, here to Village Church this morning and those of you joining us online here this, uh, this holiday weekend. My name is Brandon Smith, one of the pastors here. If you're here with us uh, on site or if this is one of your first times back uh, with us uh, since uh, some of the COVID restrictions started lifting, we are glad that you're here. Stop by guest center. Just uh, give us uh, a wave and tell us, hi, our team, we'd love to see you if you're with us online. And we're glad that you're with us in that way. And feel free to reach out to us in the church office. At any point during the week, let us know how we can uh, connect with you, how we can serve you, uh, how we can uh, answer any questions you might have at Village Church. I mean, our desire is to do as much as we can uh, to uh, administer you in whatever ways possible. Uh, we thank you for the ways that so many of you continue to give so faithfully. Uh, to the work of the Lord here at Village Church. You know, this Sunday we are wrapping up our, our third fiscal quarter. Uh, 
of our fiscal year. We are, uh, uh, we're, we're hanging in there in terms of giving while we're running uh, behind uh, pace of where we thought we, or we hoped to be at this point of the year. And we have had uh, lower than expected spending as well. Again, some things that uh, we, we weren't able to do this year uh, because of COVID. And uh, we just uh, ask that you would prayerfully consider how you could continue giving to the Lord's work here at Village Church through the summer months, because we, we, we really want and need to have a good, strong fourth quarter, uh, because that in turn sets us up well for fiscal 22. We are uh, having uh, planning process going right now, uh, starting to make some plans for next year. I was actually in a couple of meetings earlier this week where some things about fiscal year 2025 <laughs> came up. And uh, anyway, we, uh, we're thankful for the ways that God's provided for Village Church. And I just use you all as a part of that. I just ask you to continue giving faithfully uh, so that we can keep moving forward and doing the work God's called us to, not just here in Lake County, but around the world. Uh, you can give uh, online. Uh, through the Realm app, through our uh, website, so you can give here uh, in the building and the offering boxes out in the lobby. If you have questions about that, uh, let me know or let uh, Diane Dirk and our financial coordinator know. We'll be happy to help you with that. Uh, Pastor Dan referenced our outdoor uh, worship services, Village on the Lawn, coming up on June 20th and July 11th, and then again on August 1st, the Sunday where we will celebrate baptism. Again, those will be uh, days. It's just one service. 10 a.m., mark your calendars for that. You see the things that we encourage you to bring. Um, we, we encourage you to plan to stick around afterwards. Uh, bring a picnic lunch, or you can, you can run to a local restaurant, pick up something in a drive through bring it back. But we're really looking for ways that uh, even as we're, we're reconnecting, re-engaging with, with life and ministry here in person as a church family, that we, we provide ways for people to enter back into that. Um, come join us. Uh, these are, I know, summer times that, uh, you know, we can travel and so forth, but uh, whatever you do, don't play hooky uh, during those Sundays. Don't play hooky at all during the summer, for that matter. Um, there's a lot of things that we have planned uh, that we're looking forward to seeing God move and work here uh, in our lives and through our church, and we want every one of you uh, to be a part of that with us. So uh, make plans to join us, in particular, on these special Sundays, and, and again, we look forward to uh, everything that God has in store for us in these uh, summer months to come. We're looking forward to what God has for us today, as well as we continue worshiping him through the study of the word. Pastor Dave will be coming forward at this time as we continue on in our study of 1 John chapter 5. Amen. Thank you, Brandon. Let me pray before we look at God's word today. Father, we, we come before you. We thank you for this Sunday to, um, to declare your praise, to pray to you, to encourage and build one another up through these reminders that we have sung to see baptisms, Lord, take place, these physical, literal expressions of a spiritual transformation that has already taken place. We praise you for that. And Father, as we look at your word, we would ask that you would continue to work in us. Lord, I pray for all who can hear my voice, Lord. Encourage the discouraged, strengthen the weak, provide hope to those who are struggling with hopelessness and despair. Provide confidence, Lord, to the anxious. Uh, give us your presence, Lord, by your spirit, through your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, as we are wrapping up this series through 1 John, we've seen all throughout the book from beginning to end just how true it is that God is. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is our light and our life. And as we approach the end of the book, we, we saw in um, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, John actually shows us the purpose for this letter that John is writing actually to, to believers, to Christians. And he's, he writes in 1 John 5, 13, he writes these things that to those who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life that you may know it, that you may have confidence in it, that you may have assurance, dear Christian, that in Christ you are in him, and in him you are saved, and that you can know for sure that you have eternal life. And in many ways, by the time we get to 1 John 5, 13, it's actually been no surprise. We've seen that theme and that thread, that strain, and this idea uh, coming through the entire uh, book of 1 John. Let me summarize just a short list of 16 reminders that we've seen this throughout the whole book. Check this out. Our assurance in knowing him is shown by obeying and following him. It's being God's child. It's shown by righteous living. 
It's knowing Jesus, who is God. Our assurance in knowing him is shown by loving believers as Christ loved us. It's belonging to the truth. It's uh, shown by freedom from guilt and shame. It's receiving the Spirit. It's knowing the Spirit, who is God. It's shown by accepting Scripture's teaching. Our assurance in knowing Him is shown by loving others. It's being given the Spirit. It's knowing we're loved by Him. It's shown by love for others and obedience to God. Our assurance in knowing Him is knowing God's Son, Jesus Christ. All of these things show us that the entire book, a, a massive theme of the book, which is summarized in 1 John 5, 13, is this word of encouragement and confidence to Christians, to believers, that you may know that you have eternal life. And we see all throughout the book, in some ways, these two categories of how we see this assurance play out, that our assurance is first, the, the, the root of our assurance, if I can say it that way, the root of our assurance in Christ is who we have, it's that we have Him. The root of our assurance is not in our efforts, it's not in our performance, it's not in how great I art. <laughs> the root of our assurance is not rooted in us at all. It's actually, in some ways, outsourced to Christ. It's His vicarious atonement on our behalf, it's His performance, it's His work, it's His righteousness, it's His purity, it's His holiness, that when we put our faith in Him, becomes ours. The root of our assurance is in who we have, and we have Christ. And then the fruit of our assurance, the implications, uh, the things that flow from salvation in Christ, we see all throughout the letter of 1 John that the fruit of our assurance is shown in not who we have, but how we love. How we love God. How we love God in obedience. How we love God in trust and discipleship and following Him and saying no to sin and yes to righteousness. How we love God uh, in, in spending time with Him in word and prayer. How we love God in all these different ways. How we love. But not only how we love God, but also how we love one another. And what a timely, important, convicting, hard, challenging message that this entire book of 1 John has urged us and pushed us and called us to live in light of who we have been made to be in Christ, that as we love one another, even in hard times, even in difficult times, even in times of disagreement, even when people might not see eye to eye on, on everything that is going on in our world, in our life, God calls us to love one another. And when we do that, we are revealing and showing the fruit of the assurance and salvation that we already have. So if that is what assurance is, rooted in who we have, revealed in how we love God and others. If that is assurance, then what are the implications of assurance for our life? What does assurance mean for you and I? What significance does that have for us as we navigate daily life? Well, the final four verses are going to speak just to that. So please do meet me uh, at 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 21, the, the last four verses of this New Testament book of 1 John. If you're using the Bible uh, in the chair in front of you or behind you, uh, it's on page 1213, 1213. 1 John chapter 5. Let me read the passage before we look at it closely. 1 John 5, 18. We know, we know, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know, second, second time we see this phrase repeated, we know in this passage that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Verse 20, third time, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. If our assurance, if God is our light in our life and we have assurance in Him, the significance that this shows for our daily life, we see in this first verse, is that assurance means that sin cannot take your soul, dear brother and sister in Christ. Assurance means that sin can no longer 
and no longer has hold or say or final control over your soul. Isn't that good news? Look at this verse one more time. Let me read it again. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now, we've seen throughout this letter, 1 John, as it's talked about in many passages and in different ways, uh, our relationship as humanity and our relationship as, as believers to sin. And when it says, verse 18, we know that everyone who has been born of him, of God, those who've been regenerated, those who've been born again, those who have trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, those who are of the family of God, Everyone who's been born of God does not keep on sinning. Well, what does that mean? We've seen throughout the letter, you can uh, check back later this week or later today at 1 John chapter 3, reread that passage. It shows this idea in 1 John 3, 4, and 5. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. This idea that uh, when we sin, it reveals the condition of our heart. And when it's saying in 1 John 5, 18, that those who have been born of God do not keep on sinning. It's describing a human heart that has been, by faith, uh, by grace through faith, a heart of stone has been replaced with a heart of flesh. And that having been regenerated and made new and saved, the human heart now is no longer, as it was before we were saved, no longer in open rebellion and rejection consistently and persistently our entire lives saying no to God and no to the gospel and no to Christ. Once we've given our lives to Him, we get a heart transplant. Everything changes. Our heart of stone is replaced with a heart of flesh. And what this phrase is talking about, keep on sinning, it's this perpetual, constant, continuous, forever rejection of God as, as the idea that he is a moral lawgiver, the rejection of God and certainly his son, Jesus Christ, a rejection of the gospel, that once we trust in Christ, that completely changes. And what that means is that, catch this, dear Christian, brother and sister in Christ, this only applies to Christians, and if you're not, if you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian yet, or you're checking out Christianity uh, this truth can be true of you. This is not a closed door. This is an open door. This is an offer. It's, it's something the Lord wants you to have. But do you know, Christians, that in Christ, you are free from the penalty of sin? Do you know that? Sometimes we can know that, but sometimes it can be hard to know that, if you're with me. Do you know that, Christian, you are free from the penalty of sin? Uh, summarized very well in a famous verse in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period, full stop. That in Christ, if we put our faith and trust and hope in Him, we no longer are bearing the weight and the penalty and the condemning power of sin over our lives. How is that true? Why is that true? It's true because He, he swapped places with us. That he bore the wrath that we deserved. He took the punishment for us. He is our vicarious substitute. That in his death, God's wrath and justice is satisfied. And by faith in him, mercy and forgiveness and love can be given to us. And in Christ, the penalty of sin is gone. That's what this assurance means for you and I as Christians. Now, the penalty of sin is gone, and at the same time, fellow believers, we cannot deny sin's presence, nor can we be naive to sin's power. It's an interesting relationship that believers have with sin. We are free from the penalty of sin. Nothing can pluck you from his hand. We get this both and. We get this on the one hand, uh, we as Christians face sin with utter confidence, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We see this at least in one, many passages that affirm this truth, but I'm just going to draw attention to one. John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, my father who has given them to me, Jesus says, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So Jesus is saying, by faith through grace, 
you are in his hand and you're in the Father's hand. And Jesus and the Father are one. And my friends, if you are resting and residing in the hands of our triune Father, you can have confidence that nothing, nothing, nothing can pluck you from his hand. I remember in my journey of, of Christian discipleship, which I'm still on, we're all still on, but I remember along the way, I had someone asked me a question that was a help to me during a season where I was wrestling with my sense of eternal security. And they looked at me and asked me and said, David, if you have done nothing to earn your salvation in terms of your works and your efforts and your performance and your behavior and et cetera, et cetera, if you've done nothing to earn your salvation, if it's all of sheer grace, then what makes you think you can do something to lose your salvation? Nothing can pluck you from his hand. So on the one hand, we have this incredible confidence and hope and assurance that we are free from the penalty of sin. At the same time, fellow believers, because sin is still sticking around, we can't deny its presence, and we can't be naive to its power. Earlier in the book, in 1 John, remember in the opening chapter, there's a passage that, that basically says, if we say we have no sin, if we deny sin's presence in our lives, we're kind of crazy. We're delusional. We're, we're saying that God is a liar. Uh, well, and if anyone says, hey, I'm a Christian, and I've, <laughs> I've arrived. I'm sin-free. Well, once you help them see that that's an expression of pride, <laughs> you, can, you can realize, wait, that's, that's not true to what Scripture says. Until Christ returns, he's coming back, amen, and, and that's good news. Until he comes back, the presence of sin in our lives, in the world, in society, in families, in communities, and it's still there. And it's still powerful. There, sin is not something that is designed for us to manage. Sin is not something designed that we can just kind of experiment with. Sin is not something that, uh, uh, you know, might add a little spice and flavor to our life. Sin is something that if we let it get a foothold in our life, destroys.